Okay, so as you heard, uh, next week will basically be a and a <laughs> session, same room, so come early. Hopefully it won't be completely crowded. Uh, I won't be doing it, Spiros will be doing it, but, well, I, he's, he's excellent and he can answer all your questions and go over all that stuff just as well, if not better, than I can. So anyway, what I would like to do, though, in the meantime, is make a valiant effort to finish what I hadn't finished from 6.2, 6.3, and then 7.1 and 7.2. That will be covering a little more than I usually do, so perhaps we could save the questions to the end unless there's something that's just like, that I've just said that just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so sorry about that. And my hands are a little bit tired. All right, so we had been dealing with determinants. Now I showed you how to compute them, and we got up pretty much last time to this really nice relationship, debt AB equals debt A times debt B. So determinants are preserved by products, if you prefer, or commute with products, and we looked at why that might be the case. All right, now, uh, this means that these are supposed to be n by n square matrices. They have to be the same size for this to make sense. If either of these is not invertible, then, of course, the corresponding determinant will be 0, and therefore the product is not invertible as well. So that's consistent with that fact. Now, here are some applications of this fact, which are very straightforward, but nevertheless deserve to be written down by themselves. So the first thing is if you have the determinant of a to the n, so you take an nth power. Well, that is predictably the nth power of the determinant of the original matrix. Why is that so? Just write this as a times a times a times a times a times a, times a n copies, and use the above formula, n times. So you bust it up into debt a times debt a times debt a times debt a, etc., n times. So you get the nth power of the determinant. <coughs> okay, so one application of this, so here's a true false type of question. So if the determinant of B, so EG, if determinant of B is say minus 4, is B equal to A squared for any A, for some A? That's a true false question or yes no question. Well. If it were, if b equals a squared, then the debt of b determinant would be the determinant of a squared, which is the determinant of a all squared. So I brought the squared out. Debt a times a is debt a times debt a. And that's supposed to be equal minus 4. Well, you can't have a square equal minus 4, so this is impossible. So no. So any matrix with a negative determinant cannot be the square of some of any other matrix. So they don't have square roots. Square roots are rather tricky in a matrix sense. But these ones don't have any. All right. Another application. That's one. This is two. OK, we know that A inverse times A is the identity of whatever dimension you're in. So, of course, the determinant of A inverse A is the determinant of the identity, which is, of course, 1. Remember, if you have a diagonal matrix, or in fact a triangular matrix, be it upper or lower, the determinant is just the product of the diagonals. I'm just saying this, but you can write it down to remind yourself. I wrote it down last week. Anyway, so the determinant of the identity is 1 times 1 down to 1, which is 1. But, of course, this is equal to the determinant of A inverse times the determinant of A. So if you divide by this determinant of A, you see that, therefore, the determinant of A inverse is 1 over the determinant of A. So the inverse matrix has the reciprocal determinant. Now what if A is not invertible? then this is 0, and vice versa. So this is never a problem. This is, if A 
If that's zero, then A inverse doesn't exist. So this formula is all good, of course, if A has an inverse. If not, well then, neither this A inverse nor 1 over 0 makes sense. So the formula breaks down. And by the way, you could view this as an extension of the previous formula with n equals minus 1. Right? That's actually consistent with the previous formula, although a to the minus 1 is not really a power in the traditional sense. Since it is a different thing. But the same logic works for determinants. All right. The third thing is this. If A is similar to B, and we discussed this, remember geometrically that means A and B represent the same linear transformation but with respect to different bases. So this is a change of basis sort of stuff. Uh, and we decided that A could be then written as S, B, S inverse, where S is some change of basis matrix, so it's invertible. OK, so what's the determinant of A? The determinant of A is the determinant of S, B, S inverse, which is the determinant of S times the determinant of B times the determinant of S inverse, which is the determinant of S times the determinant of B times 1 over the determinant of s, because the determinant of the inverse is 1 over, as we just saw. And you, see, and cancel, you can get the determinant of b. Now, I just want to comment something that may not be obvious. You might say, well, why couldn't you just cancel the s and the s inverse? Of course, the matrices do not commute, so you can't just switch the b and the s. Why do the determinants commute? Because they're just numbers. This is a number times a number times a number. These are not matrices. When you take the determinant of a matrix, it boils it down to one number. Quick question. I can... So couldn't you write a determinant of x times s inverse times the determinant of a? Yeah, I mean, it, but this is more, this is using the facts that we already know. I mean, I agree that when it comes to determinants, if you have a whole product, you can mix them, you can change the order in the product and it, it's working. But that follows from this anyway. Anyway, the point is, similar matrices have the same determinants. And we'll say more later on. They have more than the same determinants. They have the same characteristic polynomials and all this other stuff. But for the moment, let's just take that. OK. And finally, as someone noted last time, the determinant of A transpose equals the determinant of A. Strictly speaking, that doesn't follow from this first fact, but it's very useful to, uh, to understand it. And the basic idea being that anything you do on the rows to simplify it, you could also do on the columns. And you, so you would end up with the same thing, because we've decided you can expand on rows or columns. It doesn't matter which row you pick or which column you pick to expand. You get the same thing. So any of these operations you use for your Gauss-Jordan elimination work in rows or columns. So if they work here for rows, they work here for columns, and you get the same answer. That's not a proof, but it's a little, little thing to uh, motivate it. Anyway, so you should really be aware of these four facts, as well as the granddaddy of them all up there. All right, so the only other thing I have to say about 6.2 is linearity of rows or columns. OK, so let's consider this. I'll do the linearity of rows first. This is a sort of subtle little fact, but it's worth knowing. So here's the deal. Suppose I fix a matrix. So fix a matrix A, but leave one of the rows out. So A looks like this. One, two, three, whatever. These numbers are five, etc. But I'm going to leave this one blank and then fill in the rest. OK, so it doesn't matter which row. You're just going to pick one. Specify all of the others. And this is n by n, including the blank row. Now we're going to fill in the blank. So now, define a map, define a linear transformation. Well, define a transformation. It's a bit of a weird one. 
it goes like this. Let x be, say, a column vector. x be a column vector. So x transpose, as we know, is a row vector. And what I want to do is I want to let t of x be equal to this matrix A, but with x filling in the blank, x transposes actually, as before. Okay, so I'm going to fill in the blanks of one whole row. And I want to do, and then I want to take the determinant. So this is A here. I want it to take the determinant of this. Okay, so it's a weird transformation. I just, I, I don't know what one row is. I kind of take my column vector, I tip it up as a row vector, and I bung it in there. And then I take the determinant. So this is a map. T is a map from Rn, because I start with an n-dimensional vector. I have to fill in all of these things. But I just get back a number. I get back a number because I get a matrix, and then I just take the determinant. Okay? So the point is, this is a linear map. So claim this is a linear map. In other words, t of x plus y equals t of x plus t of y. Okay, another way to interpret this would be that if two matrices are the same except for one row where they differ, then you can add up the determinants. So application, so alternatively, two, five, six, seven, eight, three, minus four, two. Plus, let's, let's just call this matrix A. Let's do this. Let's call this A, and let's call this B. I'm going to take the same matrix, 1, 2, 5, but I'm going to change the row to, say, 0, 4, minus 2. And I'll keep the last two, the last row. So basically, A and B are the same except for the second row here, the same row in each position. So what, then, is the determinant of A plus B? Well. I'm going to tell you that is the determinant of what am I saying here? No, I don't mean A plus B. How does the determinant of A compare to the determinant of B is what I'm trying to say. So basically this is, so if I take the determinant of A, this is equal to T of 6, 7, 8. And the determinant of B is equal to T of 0, 4, minus 2. So if I wanted to know what the determinant of the matrix with the same thing, 1, 2, 5, 3, minus 4, 2, but now I add up these corresponding numbers. So I get 6 plus 0, which is 6. 4 plus 7, which is 11, and minus 2 plus 8, which is 6. This will equal the sum of the determinants, debt A plus debt B. OK, so I haven't actually added the, matrix, the matrices together. I've just added the middle row. So it's not true, in general, that debt A plus B is equal to debt A plus debt B. This is just not true. It's true for the products, but the sum, you cannot take the sum of the two matrices and then take the determinant and just express it as the sum of the determinants. You cannot do that. The best you can do is just add, take two matrices with exactly the same structure, and if they just differ in two rows, then you can get the determinant of those two rows summed up. All right, now that's a pretty obscure fact, but I'll tell you one way where you where it becomes quite useful to know this fact. You may recall last time that we looked at 
how to do the determinant by using Gauss-Jordan elimination. And we decided that in Gauss-Jordan elimination, we claimed the following. There were three different operations. One is you can switch rows. One is you could multiply a row. But <coughs> the most controversial one, one possible operation, the operation where you add, add a multiple of one row to another. Right, that's the pretty useful one. Or you subtract a multiple of one row, same thing. That doesn't change the determinant. We've learnt this, but we don't know why. And this fact will show how, we'll see why it's true. Here it is. We have a matrix A. Okay, so suppose that this row here is, say, V1 as a column, as a row <laughs> vector, and this row is V2. And the rest of it doesn't matter. And now we want to take, compare with this. <coughs> v. So we'll leave the first row as V1, but we're going to add some multiple of the first row to the second row. Same as before. <coughs> That's the only difference, is we've added k times one row to the other. And we remember, we do that all the time in Gauss-Jordan elimination. This is just the algebraic formality. And of course, I've chosen the first two rows, but it, the same thing works with any row. OK, so what is the determinant of b? According to what I've said, the determinant of b is equal to the determinant of the original matrix A, because that's the same with the v2, plus the determinant in fact, the k times the determinant, because it's fully linear, of this matrix, v1, v1, v3, and so on. Same. <coughs> OK, as in, it's linear in the rows. Let me write out determinant of A like this. OK, so these two matrices, bang and bang, have exactly the same structure, except the second row here is V2, and the second row here is V1. So <coughs> by what I'm saying, this whole linearity, you can pack up that second row as V2 plus KV1 into B. And that's cool, as long as all the other rows are the same. If any of them are different, the whole thing is off. OK? So that's the linearity of the determinant in the rows. But so what? This is equal to determinant of A. What's this determinant? The matrix has two rows which are the same. What is its determinant? Zero. Why is it zero? Not linearly. Okay, the rows are not linearly independent. How do we know that the rows are not linearly independent? Well, two of them are the same. So what if the rows aren't linearly independent? Well the determinant, it's, it's not invertible. So this is k times 0. OK, so this is an important fact. Well, in any... Well, think of it, OK, one way to do it is the transpose. OK, if the columns, if two of the columns of a matrix are the same, or at least the columns are not in linearly independent, then it's a term, it won't be invertible, so its determinant is 0. But the determinant of the transpose is the same as the determinant of the original. That's one way of seeing it. Okay? So basically, I'm using here, use here the fact that if the rows or columns of a square matrix are not linearly independent, <coughs> the matrix is not invertible. We need to know that. So determinant is 0. So in this particular matrix, it doesn't matter what I can say about the columns, about the rows, 
in general, two of them are the same, so they're not linearly independent. Question. How did you get that? How did I get this? Yeah. Okay, so here are two matrices that are exactly the same except the second row. Oh, that has nothing to do with B, right? Well, this is B. So, oh, right. right, so if you take the determinant of B, as long as you just bust up one of the rows into two pieces, that's fine. Okay? Anyway, it's not good to get too caught up by that. I really haven't seen a lot of questions involving the linearity in the rows, but I guess it's possible. Now, one other comment, and then I'm finished 6.2. Also, Linear, debt is linear in the columns as well, in one column as well. So the same trick works if you define t of x as just fill in the blank column and take the determinant. Same thing. I don't want to go into it. You don't need to take the transpose of x like we did before. You just fill in the column so it's linear in the column. So here is a stupid reverse example. If I just take the determinant of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you might say this is equal to the determinant of 1, 2, 3. Let's do the, I, I don't know, let's do the third column. So how about I do this? 1, 2, 1, 4, 5, 4, 7, 8, 7 plus the determinant of 1. I'm not going to touch the first two columns, but I will touch this column and I'll write 2, 2, 2. I don't know why you'd need this fact, but it happens to be true. Okay. What I'm saying is I want to add up these two determinants. This column is the same as this column. This column is the same as this column. The last columns are different, so I can add them up. <coughs> Well, even if they were the same, I could still add them up. But only the last columns are different. So I can keep the first two columns unchanged and add that plus that in there. But you cannot do that for more than one row or more than one column at a time. It just is not good. It doesn't work. You can do it for one row or one column at a time. OK, so that's basically the end of 6.2. All right. For those of you who come in, came in a little later, I'm going fast tonight because I'm trying to get through all the theory before next week. All right, let's talk about the geometry of determinants, okay? Areas and volumes and what the determinant means in terms of them. So that's the topic of 6.3. Now, the first thing that it notes is that if A is orthogonal, so this is a useful fact that I could have thrown into the previous chapter, but this is in the book here. If A is orthogonal, so this sort of ties into the section on orthogonal matrices that we did earlier, then A transpose A is the identity. That's the definition of orthogonal. Well, that's one way of doing we, we saw this as equivalent to it anyway. So the determinant of A transpose A, the determinant of the identity, which is 1. Of course, the determinant of the product, you can write as the determinant, uh, the product of the determinants. I just bust that up like that. And the determinant of the transpose is the same as the original determinant. So debt A, debt A equals 1. So this, i.e., debt A squared, <coughs> that number squared is 1. So debt A plus or minus 1. if A is orthogonal. All right, the orthogonal matrices have determinant 1 or minus 1. That's the only possibility. If you think of orthogonal matrices in two dimensions, they basically fall into two <laughs> categories. Bless you. One is a rotation. That's orthogonal. Remember, orthogonal, in addition to writing it like this, it preserves length. So it doesn't squish or stretch or anything. It can just rotate, in which case the determinant would be 1. Or it could reflect. Remember, reflections are also orthogonal. They have the lengths are preserved. They just get reflected. So what's the determinant of a reflection? <coughs> Answer, minus 1. It's minus 1. Why is it minus 1? 
Well, we'll see. Not quite ready. Not quite ready, but almost. Actually, maybe we, we sort of are ready in a way. At least it depends what you're reflecting in. If you reflect in a hyperplane or something like that, so for example, in a three by three, this is a bit of an aside, but why is the determinant of a reflection in a plane equal to minus one? Why is that true for any plane? Exactly. We saw before that with, if you do it with respect to a basis where two of the vectors are in the plane and the third vector is out of the plane but perpendicular to it, then this vector is reflected to the same, this vector is reflected to the same, whereas this one goes to minus itself. So with respect, so if A is the matrix, A is similar to 1, 1, minus 1 with respect to this basis here, V1, V2, and V3, <coughs> where V3 is perpendicular, that will be the matrix. And this has determinant equals minus 1, and similar matrices have the same determinant. Debt A equals minus 1. All right? So anything similar to a diagonal matrix is very easy to compute the determinant. And in particular, reflections have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and a minus 1 in one entry. That's if it's a reflection in a plane, say. If you do a reflection in a line, well, maybe it's more complicated because then you actually have two of the vectors being minus 1. So you have two of the diagonals, rather. So you have 1, minus 1, minus 1, and the determinant would actually be 1. Anyway. Do matrices that are the same size and have the same determinant? Are they going to be No. Matrices have other. Uh, so the question was, if two matrices have the same size and the same determinant, are they similar? Here's an example. 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 1, 0, 0. OK, the determinant in both cases is 1, because th they're both triangular. You just multiply the diagonals. Yet nothing is similar to the identity except itself. Right? If, if A is similar to the identity, then A equals S, I, S inverse. But now, S, I is just S, so this is the identity. Only the identity is similar to itself. Yes? Um, isn't that thing, if uh, A transpose A is the identity, then yes. A orthogonal? Yes, if A transpose A is the identity, A is orthogonal. Okay. But just knowing the determinant is 1 doesn't tell you that the matrix is orthogonal. For example, this matrix is not orthogonal, right, and it right, has right. determinant yeah. 1. It's only a fact that orthogonal matrices have determinant 1. This we saw last time or the time before, that if A is orthogonal, then A, A transpose A is identical. So that you have to know. All right, now, more about the geometry than in general. Now, it gets a little bit technical. Uh, it gets a little bit technical, but I do want to spend maybe five minutes just showing you some geometry that you're very unlikely to be examined on, frankly. Uh, eventually you will need to know the result and I'll tell you when it is but I, I do think it's important to have at least some idea of what we're doing okay so basically here's the idea if we have a bunch of vectors I work in three dimensions just because the book does two and you can read the book so I, I might as well do something different so we're gonna have three vectors like this actually I'll call them UV and W what the hey no I won't I call them V1, V2, and V3. OK. So I want you to think of these as being in three dimensions, although they could just as easily be in four or five. I just can't draw them. OK. So now, what I want to do is I want to find a parallelopiped, which is this sort of, it's like a deformed rectangular prism. It would be a rectangular prism if you see these all perpendicular to each other. I didn't draw it very well because I sort of ran out of space. OK, so what I'm interested in is what's the volume of that? What is the volume of that? That's the, that's the problem that we're interested in. OK, so in order to find it, how do you find a volume? Well, a volume is equal to the base area 
times the perpendicular height. So one thing I'm going to be interested in is what is this perpendicular height? That's the perpendicular height h. So if I knew the area of the base and I knew the height, then I could just use this and there'd be no problem. So how do I know what the h is? Well, actually, all I have to do is project v3 onto this plane spanned by v1 and v2. So this is the projection of v3 onto p, where p is this plane. And so this vector here is v3 perp. It's the perpendicular. All right. And the length, so actually the perpendicular height is the length of v3 perp, where the perpendicular to the plane, i.e. the length of v3 perp. That's, that's the length of the vector. Well, what about the base itself? We still got to do the base area. Well, the base area, <coughs> let's just look at two vectors now. Here's v1 and here's v2. And the base is a parallelogram. Well, it's the same idea. It's equal to the length times the perpendicular height. So what's this? What's this height here? Well, I project v2 onto v1. And then I take v2 perp. So the perpendicular height is the length of v2 perp. Where this time, v3 perp, whoops, was the projection of v3 onto this plane, whereas v2 perp is just the projection of v2 onto this line, this one vector v1. So you have to understand that. It's not very, very clear from the notion perp what it's perpendicular to, but you just have to understand the geometry. So we have that. What about the length? Well, this time, the length is just v1. All right. So the base area is equal to v1 times v2 perp. <coughs> and remember, the height of the this height here is the length of v3 perp. So the volume is v1 v2 perp, well that's the perpendicular onto just v1, and then v3 perp, where that's the perpendicular onto v1 and v2. All right, well that's all very good, and in fact you can now see how to generalize it to four dimensions. I can't draw it, but if you had a fourth dimension, well the, the base of it would actually be that. <laughs> it's a three-dimensional base. A three-dimensional object has a two-dimensional base, a four-dimensional object has a three-dimensional base. And then the volume or the hypervolume of this four-dimensional parallel of Piper should be the three-dimensional volume of the base times the perpendicular height. So that would give me this, then times a v4 perp, and then so on. If I wanted to do a five-dimensional thing, I would have this four-dimensional volume as the base volume times the height, which would be a v5 perp, and so on. All right, so now we have to ask, where have we ever seen these perps? Do not say something like Grand Theft Auto. So where have we seen them before? All right, here's where we've seen them. If A equals QR, which we kind of gave short shrift to in the lead up to the midterm, but never mind. Then Q is, say A is square. If A is square, then Q and R are also the same. The same dimension. And Q was the matrix U1, Un, which comes from when you try to Gram-Schmittize A. 
So A starts life as V1 Vn, and it gets transformed into QR. This is provided it makes sense if A is invertible, by the way. If A is not invertible, you can't do this because the columns would not be linearly independent. And so the Gram-Schmidt will break down. But we'll talk about that in a second. R, on the other hand, was an upper triangular matrix. And if you don't believe me, you can look it up in the textbook. The diagonals are exactly these quantities. V1, V2 perp, V3 perp, and so on, all the way down to Vn perp. That's, and then here there was stuff with dot products, but it doesn't matter what it was. Not for this case. And then here it was all zeros. It's upper triangular. What goes on in the QR case? Anyway, debt A is debt Q, debt R. Because A is Q times R. And these are both squares. What is the determinant of Q? Well, tell me about Q. It's a square matrix. The columns are orthonormal. The columns are an orthonormal basis. So what can we say about Q? One. Not only does it have determinant 1, but what would you call the <coughs> matrix Q? What sort of matrix is it? Orthogonal. We saw many characterizations last time of orthogonal matrices. One is that they preserve lengths. Two is that they preserve dot products. Three is that A transpose A is the identity. And four is that the columns form an orthonormal basis. And the rows also form an orthonormal basis. So this means Q is orthogonal. OK? So Q is orthogonal. In the QR factorization of a square matrix, the Q part is orthogonal. So as we've seen, the determinant is plus or minus 1. That's what we just saw before. The determinant of R is pretty easy. It's just the product of the diagonals because it's upper triangular. Remember, triangular matrices, either upper or lower, the determinant is just the product of the diagonals. So you get V1, V2 perp, V3 perp, up to Vn perp. But guess what? This is just the volume. This is the, so it's plus or minus the volume of the n-dimensional parallelepiped spanned by V1 up to Vn in Rn. And of course, I showed you the formula for three three-dimensional vectors. And of course, you could do it for two-dimensional or four four-dimensional. So basically, what it comes down to is, i.e., this volume is the absolute value of the determinant of A. See, the plus or minus will go away if you take absolute values of both sides. If the determinant is negative, then the, you don't really want a negative volume. That will tell you something about the orientation. You get into things like right-hand rules. You know, if the right-hand rule is obeyed, the determinant is positive. If it's like this, it's negative. Let's not get into that. You just take the absolute value and get the volume. Now, by the way, if A is not invertible, what you will find is one of these perpendiculars is 0. If A is not invertible, one of these perpendiculars will be 0, because that will mean for example, if V3 is already in the span of any one V2, the perpendicular is 0. And so that entry will be 0. And you'll get a 0 element there. But A will also be not invertible, so the determinant is 0. So the volume is going to be 0 because one of the elements is in the plane of the other. So in this case over here, if V3 was in the plane of V1 and V2, the parallel of Piper is not really volumesque. Volume, well, it doesn't have volume. It's flat. 
All right. So this is a remarkable fact. But in some sense, that's what the determinant really is. It's the volume. It, it's a volume. So we've given it by a formula, but it's really a geometrical object. It's just rather hard to visualize in more than three dimensions. All right, so that's an important formula. Okay, so you need to know that if, well, there's the formula. So if you have n vectors in Rn, the volume of the spanned power thing is the absolute value of the determinant of A, where A has columns or rows, if you prefer, given by these vectors. Okay. So I could give an example, but all you have to do is take a determinant. I don't have a lot of time. But I will give a slightly different example. There's plenty of examples in the previous quizzes of this sort of phenomenon. However, there's a little more to the story. There's a little more to the story. Because sometimes you might only have, say, two vectors in R3, and you want to know what is the area of the parallelogram that they span. So for example, in this case, I was dealing with three vectors. What if I only have two vectors in space? Well, they still form a parallelogram, and it has an area. It doesn't have a volume. But this method's not going to work. This method will not work with only two vectors. Because it's not even a square. Well, here's the trick there. So what if only n vectors in Rn, where m is less than n? There's still an m-dimensional volume. And, and it actually is best written as, well, it is written as the square root of the determinant of A transpose A. OK, so those two formulas you have to know. Now, I didn't prove the bottom one, but I want to say a couple of things about it. Actually, you know what? Uh, it's kind of pretty. It is kind of pretty. Uh, I'll, I'll explain it in a few seconds. But there's the formula. I'll give an example of that first, and then I'll just tell you for a few seconds why it's true. Here's the things I want to comment. Why not just take the determinant? Well, here, a is not even square. Note, a is an n by n. So it has fewer rows, I mean, more rows than columns. So we have v1 up to vm. But these are bigger. n is bigger than m. So it doesn't have a determinant. <coughs> but note that a transpose ti uh, times a is m by m. So it does have a determinant. It does have a determinant. So this makes sense. It's square. So you can take this matrix, which is square, you can take its determinant and then take the square root. Now, what if you accidentally use this formula for n by n matrix? So if you did have this case, couldn't you also use this formula? The answer is yes, and I'll show you why. Just let's do it in our heads. <coughs> Suppose a is actually square. Then the determinant of this times this is equal to the determinant of a transpose times the determinant of a. Right? You can't do this. You cannot do this. Debt a transpose a equals debt a transpose a if a is not square. So this is only true if a is square. Otherwise, these two determinants don't make sense. Even though this makes sense, the right-hand side wouldn't. In any case, the determinant of A transpose is the same as the determinant of A. So this is the determinant of A squared. So if you insert that in here, you get the square root of the square, which is just the absolute value of the determinant, which is this. OK, so basically, if you do make the mistake of using this formula when A is square, 
you will get the right answer, but you will waste a lot of time. So do not use this when it's square, even though you get the right answer. Much easier to just take the determinant and then the absolute value. I'll give you an example of this right now. Suppose we have two vectors. V1 is 1, 1, 1, 1, and V2 is 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. OK, these are two vectors in R4. I can't even draw them because it's too complicated. But whatever they look like, they're, they form a parallelogram. So the parallelogram, lelogram, it's not even ah, parallelopiped, spanned by these. has what area? <coughs> so it's a two-dimensional object sitting in four dimensions. What is its area? Well, according to this formula, you just take A is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's got these as columns. And you take A transpose A. So you have to rewrite out A tipped over. Then you have to write out A itself. Now, this should be a 2 by 2 matrix. And you get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 is 4. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot product is 10. This one will also be 10. In fact, I'm guaranteed it will be symmetric. And then the other one is 9, 1, plus 9 is 14, plus 16 is 30. And so the area is the square root of the determinant of A transpose A, which is the square root of, and we'll do 4 times 30 is 120, minus 10 times 10. So it's root 20 square units. Sorry? This was in the homework, right? Uh, it might have been in the homework, yeah. In any case, it's not very hard. But you do need to know the formula. All right. Any other questions about that sort of that board there? <laughs> All right. So let's see. Why is this true? Just for just for your reference, in case they ask a true false question about it. Um, let's just see why. You can tune out if you prefer to take the risk that they won't ask a question on it, which is probably a very small risk to take. Um, a equals QR in general. That's always true if the columns of A are linearly uh, independent. But here, in general, Q is an M. No, I'm sorry. Q is an M by M matrix an n by m matrix, and r is an m by m matrix. That's better. So q is not an orthogonal matrix, because it's not square. It only has m vectors, but so it has more rows than columns. But it's easy to see that q transpose q is equal to the identity. And we actually touched upon this last time. I want you to note that Q, Q transpose is the projection matrix. Why, why do you see the first one? Why is this true? Yeah. OK. Just because, just because it could come up, watch this. Q transpose looks like this. Whereas Q looks like this. User length one. I'm sorry, user what? Length one. This is an orthonormal, basis. an orthonormal basis of the span of the image of A. Not the span, the actual image of A. So these are orthonormal. But not a full orthonormal basis, only of a subspace, because there's only M of them. But sure enough, when you do this, you get u1.u1, u1.u1, dot u2, and so on. And fill those in, and you'll see that the diagonals are 1 and everything else is not 1. That's an important thing to understand. But I want to remind you 
that QQ transpose is not the identity and is in fact the n by n projection matrix, whereas this is I m. Anyway, so what? So what? Well, <laughs> the determinant of A, well, we can't do that because A is not square. But we can do the determinant of A transpose A because it is square. So this is the determinant of, what's A transpose? It's QR transpose. Okay? That is equal to R transpose Q transpose. You have to know these transpose tricks. If you take the transpose of the product, you flip this. And so this works regardless of whether uh, these are square matrices or not. You can't take the determinants, but the transpose still makes sense. So you get R transpose Q transpose, that's the A transpose bit, times Q R. Ta da! Now, Q transpose Q is just the identity. So it goes away. So this is the determinant of R transpose R. So the determinant of A transpose A is the same as the determinant of R transpose R. And the beauty of this is that although A is not square, R is. It's M by M. So this is the determinant of R transpose times the determinant of R. And that's the same as the determinant of R. So it's the determinant of R squared. And R still is the volume. This is still the volume squared. Volume that you want <coughs> squared. And so the volume is the square root, so which is this formula here. Is R somehow similar to A? In some of your R is not similar to A because it's not even the same shape as A. Right, but it means but R. You know, it's an upper triangular matrix that contains all the information about how to change A into Q, as it were. So, if you like, R is the change of basis matrix okay. that takes any, it takes the original matrix A and changes it into an orthogonal like matrix or an orthonormal. It's, so, it orthonormalizes the columns of A. And then it's, it tells you how to how to do a, a transformation. So we haven't really done changes of bases in N and M, but it's, a sec it's essentially a reduced similarity type of thing. So the similarity takes place just in the individual rather than all of R. So it's a little more complicated than we've looked at. But yeah, so it's related to that. In any case, that's just a proof of this. This you need to know. The proof. I don't know. All right, that's covered quite a lot. Now, the only other thing in 6.3 is to do with expansion factors. Okay, so in terms of expansion factors, this is another sort of idea. It's related, but the idea is slightly different. So I want to talk about linear transformations. Let's T be a linear transformation with matrix A with respect to the standard basis, say, as we've seen. The same linear transformation can have different matrices depending on what basis that you take. OK, so here's the idea. We have E1, the standard basis, E2, and E3. And you Apply T to any of these individually. So if T of E1 might be this. T of E2 might be this vector. And T of E3 might be that vector. So you get this lovely little cube of volume 1 there. But if you transform the edges of the cube, you get these two these splayed vectors. And if you take the linear transformation actually of every point in the cube, you flesh out this parallel epipod that we've been looking at, it's spanned by these things. And so this is the first column of A. I'll call it V2, V1, and TE2 is V2, and TE3 is V3. So A is the matrix. V1, V2, 
V3, and therefore debt A is the bond of this. And the beauty of this is it doesn't matter which basis you do this with respect to because similar matrices have the same determinant. So in principle, you could take even a non-orthonormal basis. You could take any three vectors and take their volume. And then let's say that volume is 1. And then you see what they get mapped to. They get mapped to something else. You'd form the matrix with respect to that basis and take its determinant, and you get the same answer. You get the same answer. So in other words, debt A, or at least the absolute value of it, so the, I should have said the absolute value there, is equal to the expansion, the volume expansion factor. Flash. Of T. So one way of it's just a different interpretation. Before I was looking at the determinant of A as the volume itself of the parallelopiped, but now I'm trying to interpret it as saying, well, if I have any parallelogram or parallelopiped and I hit it with this T, then the new one will have a different volume, which will be this quantity times the original volume. When I say an expansion factor, I mean the new volume, new vol after T, is equal to the old vol <coughs> times the determinant of A, where, again, A is the matrix of T with respect to any basis. It doesn't matter because they all have the same determinant. So that's a nice fact. It's, it's a very powerful fact, and that is the fact that has completely driven the whole Jacobian business of multivariable calculus. So the Jacobian was the determinant of this derivative matrix. I didn't actually have an expansion exercise example picked out, although I have seen some in the previous quizzes, so you ought to look at that. But it's been asked to show, uh, see this is a little bit tricky, but uh, okay, so it turns out, let's see how much of this I can do in four minutes. So let's T of x equal AX be invertible. So it says if omega is the unit circle, this is in R2. So they call this unit circle omega. And it's a fact that T of omega is an ellipse. That's a fact. OK, so essentially then it goes like this. T sends E1 somewhere and E2 somewhere else. So suppose T sends E1 over here. OK, now, note the lengths there. OK, and it sends T of E2 somewhere else. All right. So the ellipse, it's sort of hard to see exactly what it's going to be. In fact, it's not obvious at all. Nope. If, if it's an orthogonal matrix, it's much easier. Then they would be perpendicular. So if, if A is an orthogonal matrix, then this right angle would be preserved by a right angle here. But as it turns out, this is a little bit harder than, than it's, it's a little harder to see for a non-orthogonal matrix basically, is what it comes down to. So the question being asked is as follows. What is the relationship between the circle, the ellipse, and the determinant? So without knowing anything about the, axis, about the uh, ellipse itself, here is A, here is B, and then, so this is omega, and this is T omega. And the question is, what can you say about the determinant of this matrix? OK, so I'm not going to do the third part because I don't have time. But this is a very simple question in a sense because you don't know anything about T. OK, just look at it this way. We do know about expansion. What we know 
is that the area of this ellipse is equal to the area of the circle times the absolute value of the determinant of A. That's the whole point of the expansion. So you just need to know how to find the area of the ellipse. So does anyone know the formula for the area of an ellipse? How about the area of the circle? It's radius 1. But that's only if A and B are perpendicular, isn't it? So the question, it's only if A and B are perpendicular, but A and B are not T of E1 and T of E2. Okay. It's in the question, it says A and B are the semi-minor semi and semi-major axis length. Or I got them the other way around. So basically, the determinant of A is equal to the product AB. That's what they're driving at. And then the third part shows how hard it is to do it in a specific case. But there's a theory of it, and we'll be looking at that when we do quadratic forms a little bit. All right? So anyway, it's not a, it's a conceptual question rather than a, rather than a sort of computational question. <coughs> All right. I've got to move on. I've got to move on with chapter 7. But I have an hour to do 7.1 and 7.2, and I'll give it my best shot. All right. New topic, eigenvalues. Okay, eigenvectors, eigenvalues. So the book introduces it by means of dynamical systems, but I am going to postpone that and do the theory of it first, because, hey, you've probably already seen it the book's way in class. So let A be an n by n matrix. So here's a different way of looking at it. OK, so it's square matrix. I'm going to say that V is an eigenvector of A with eigenvalue lambda. So eigenvalue is a number. This is a number, real number, as far as we're concerned. Whereas this is a vector in Rn, n dimensional vector, if the equation AV equals lambda V is true. Okay, so what? Well, if lambda is equal to 1, then AV equals V. So V is preserved by A. You hit it with A, it doesn't change. Well, what if v, lambda is 2? Well, then A just stretches out V by a factor of 2. And the beauty of it is that if you keep doing A repeatedly over and over again, then if lambda is 1, then V just stays the same. Whereas if lambda is, say, 2, then if you do it once, you get 2V. If you do it again, you get 4V. If you do it again, you get 8V. You always get twice as much as you had before. This is very nice because most vectors are not eigenvectors and you don't know where the hell they go. They go there, 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 all over the place. Whereas here, you more or less keep it. You just stretch it. But stretching is not a big problem. Same direction. Scalar multiples. Very, very nice. Okay, so these are nice vectors. An eigen in German is own. So this is like, this is A's own vector. It's very special and dear to A. A loves it. You know, it keeps it. It doesn't throw it away. Okay. Now, I want to point out, though, that V must be non-zero. So technically, this equation is true with any lambda when V is zero. <coughs> but that's not an eigenvector. Okay. So on the other hand, <coughs> lambda could be zero. Lambda could be zero. So that a v is equal to zero times v is equal to zero. So already, that means v is in the kernel of a. I.e., if v is in the kernel of a, v is an eigenvector of a with eigenvalue zero. 
That's an important and often overlooked fact. Eigenvalue zero vectors, as in eigenvectors with eigenvalue zero, are actually just members of the kernel. <laughs> All right, that's pretty nice. Okay, so as I said, this is, this is extremely useful. So for example, e.g., suppose au is equal to 2u, av is equal to minus 3v, and aw equals double. Bless you. What is a to the power of a thousand u? If you hit u a thousand times with a, well, it's just two to the thousand u. What is a to the thousand v? Well, guess what? It's minus three to the thousand. V, and which is actually equal to three to the thousand V, as it turns out. Whereas a to the one thousand W is just W. Doesn't matter how many times you hit. Suppose that a is three by three. So here are three vectors. What is the matrix of a with respect to the basis? With respect to the basis u1, I haven't actually shown that this is a basis, but what the hey, u1, u2, I'm sorry, uvw. What is it? Well, you see what happens to u, and then you express that answer in terms of uv and w. So what happens to u? What does a do to u? 2 times u. Plus how many times v? Plus how many w? Nothing. So 2, 0, 0. How about v? What does it do to v? Well, it, doesn't, it gives you minus 3v. So it gives you no u, minus 3v, and no w. How about w? It gives you no u, no v, and no w. So it's a diagonal matrix. That's why the powers are so easy to take. To take the powers of a diagonal matrix, you just take the powers of the diagonal entries. So that's so all I've done is change, this is like a change of basis. So the matrix of A to the thousand with respect to the same basis is 2 to the thousand, minus 3 to the thousand, 1 to the thousand. So the whole point is this, this is really for taking powers of a matrix essentially. Or at least that's the initial use of it. This, this whole idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, by the way, is not obscure. It, it, you may not have heard the words before, but it's very, very ubiquitous all over the place in physics, engineering. It's, it's, it's really quite important. The whole of quantum mechanics is based on eigenvalues and eigenvectors, for example. OK, a few examples. Suppose A is K times the identity, N by N. Well, then AV is K times the identity V, which is KV, for any V. So actually, every vector in Rn, except 0, never an eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector, is an eigenvector for A with eigenvalue K. K is even true of K equals zero, where A would be the zero matrix. All right, e.g., a is a rotation in R2 by, say, pi over 6. So what that does is it takes any vector and rotates it 30 degrees. Does this thing have any eigenvalues? 
for eigenvectors. Is any vector sent to a multiple of itself? No. So this has no eigenvectors. <coughs> or eigenvalues. So not every matrix even has the thing. First one has everything as an eigenvector. Second one doesn't have any. How about this? If A is orthogonal, e.g., and V is an eigenvector, I'm going to write E vec with E val lambda. Just, these are not standard abbreviations, but I, I'm going to do it anyway. Then AV equals lambda V. That's true, just by definition. So take the length of both sides. What's the length of lambda v? Well, that's just lambda times the length of v. At least you have to be a little careful. You need to take the absolute value of lambda. That's true in general. But on the other hand, this is the same as the length of V because of orthogonal. A orthogonal preserves length. So the length of V is the same as the length of AV, which is the same as the length of lambda V, which is the absolute value of lambda times the length of V. And V is not zero because it's an eigenvalue an eigenvector, and eigenvectors are not zero, so you can cancel it out. And this shows that the absolute value of lambda equals 1. So lambda equals plus or minus 1. And we have shown if any are all plus or minus 1. Sorry, what's it, I, I'm using evec as an abbreviation for eigenvec. And I'm using eval as an abbreviation for eigenvalue. But that's, as I said, that is not a standard abbreviation. I just am using it to save my hand. Uh, question. Quick question. Is this all, all plus or minus 1? I thought there was only one uh, no, no, matrices can have multiple eigenvalues. So I should have clarified in this case, the eigenvalues are 2, oh. minus 3, and 1. I, I should have mentioned that. And then the corresponding eigenvectors are u, v, and w. Okay, and so in the diagonal matrix in particular, the eigenvalues are the entries of the diagonal. And then the corresponding eigenvectors are just e1, e2, up to en. Right? Uh, you had a question as well. Uh, so like a rotation would be an example of an orthogonal matrix that wouldn't have... Right, so a, a rotation, or some rotations, if you rotate by pi, then you actually have eigen... That's the same as minus the identity in two dimensions. So some rotations, such as, well, most of them, have no eigenvalues, say. But they are orthogonal. Okay. Now, if a matrix is orthogonal and it has an eigenvalue, I guarantee you it's plus or minus 1. But I do not say that every orthogonal matrix has eigenvalue. Okay, so that's a good distinction. All right. So now, now in addition to rotations, we might as well look at reflections. So if you have a reflection, e.g., Reflection in a plane, a, a subspace V. That's a subspace of Rn. Okay, what does it do? Everything in V gets sent to the same thing. Let's call it reflection R in V. So R V, let's call it Rx, is equal to x <coughs> if x is in V. So everything in V 
gets sent to itself. Rx is minus x if x is in V perp. Everything in the perpendicular subspace gets sent to its opposite. That's the definition of a reflection. So what, what can you tell me about x being in V? Is it an eigenvector? If x is in V, is it an eigenvector? Yes. What's the eigenvalue? One. How about if x is in V perp? Is it an eigenvector? Yes. yes. Eigenvalue? Zero. Negative one. So x, every x in V is an eigenvector of R with eigenvalue one. And every x in V perp is an eigenvec of R with eigenvalue minus 1. And actually, if you think about it, there are no other eigenvectors. If something is a mixture of something in V and V perp, then it does not get sent to minus itself or any multiple of itself. It gets sent somewhere else. Because part of it gets sent to itself, and the rest of it gets sent to negative itself. So in fact, if you took any other x, any other x can be written as x parallel plus x perpendicular. And so if you do r of x, you get x parallel minus x perpendicular. So if you do, if r x is equal to lambda x, then this would mean that x parallel minus x perp, that's the reflection, would have to be equal to lambda x parallel plus lambda x perpendicular. But there's only one way of expressing any vector <coughs> as a parallel plus a perp. So this must be equal to this, and this must be equal to this. So we must have lambda x perp equals x perp and minus lambda x perp equals x perp. And the only way that can be true is if both x parallel and x perp are non-zero. That can't be true. So one of these vectors must be zero. So this can only be true. If one of x parallel, x per parallel, and x perp is zero. I.e., x is either in v or v perp. Okay, so we've actually identified all of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Right, so the, these are all the eigenvectors. A, re of a reflection. Okay, so the logic is a little bit sophisticated. I don't know if you I don't know if you'd have to come up with that proof yourself. There's the microphone. Let's see if it still works. Does it still work? Good. All right. So one more example. I won't dwell on this much more, but, well, example, projection onto V. Very similar situation. I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, P of X is equal to X if X is in V. And it's equal to X, it's equal to zero, actually, if X is in V perp. So it's very similar similar case to reflections except the eigenvalue for v perp vectors is zero, not minus one. Okay? Not a big deal. Alright, so now I gotta say a little bit about dynamical systems. Okay, 
So there's not that much to say. The idea is this. You start with a vector, a vector x0. And normally the examples for this are in two dimensions, but it could be in any number of dimensions. And we're going to define something inductively. We're going to set x at time, say, t plus 1, so that x is, so x is now a function of time, t, where we write x of t to emphasize this. And I'm going to assume that it's discrete, so that the time is in seconds. It's like 0 seconds, 1 second, 2 seconds, 3 seconds. There's nothing in between. It's just book, book, book. We're stop motion photography here. So the t here is an integer. It could be negative. We could let time go backwards, and that's going to make sense. But let's just for the moment not do that. We're going to set x of t plus 1 is going to be the vector x of t, and it'll just be a times that a times that vector. So wherever we are, if we want to know where we go next, we hit it with an a. Okay, so actually, I should tell you what x of 0 is, so we can get started. It's just this vector x sub 0. So you start somewhere. What's x of 1? So th these, are the, these are the definitions. This is the defining characteristics of a linear discrete dynamical system. Okay, but actually, that can be simplified. This boils down to this, to a non-recursive formula. And that is that x at time t is just equal to the tth power of a times x0. So this is the tth power, tth, tth, tth power. That sounds really dumb. Okay. Uh, and I commented last time that actually it's not the transpose, it's bloody confusing. The transpose is a capital T, which is not a power of A at all, it's a flip. And many authors use this little t as a transpose. I would prefer to use an n here, so there was no ambiguity. But unfortunately the book uses a t because they want to emphasize that it's time. Alright, I don't know why time can't be n, especially when it's discrete, but there you go. So you're just going to have to re realize little t is just a number, not a transpose. Now why is that equation there true? Why is it true? Well, let's just check it. According to this, x of 0 is the 0th power, which is just x0. Yep, that's true. How about x of 1? Well, that should just be a x0. Yep, x of 1 is a x0. How about x of 2? Well, x of 2 is a x of 1, which is a a x of 0, a squared. What about x of 3? Well, that's a x of 2, which is a a x of 1, which is a a a x of 0, etc. So I hope I've convinced you with my crude inductive bullying that this is true. Okay, so actually, why didn't I write it like that in the first place? Maybe I should have, but somehow this is the form that comes up in practice. So you have to be aware of how to change that into that, all right? Or at least you just say that it is true. Now. Here is the point. When you want to understand what's going on with a system like this, it is really useful to be able to take powers of A. And as we saw, it's really useful to know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. So the, the technique goes like this. Just try to find. x0, the original vector, as a linear combination of the eigenvectors, e vex. That's what you want to do. You want to express x0 as a linear combination. So in my example before, where I had au equals 2u, av equals minus 3v, and aw equals w. Suppose that you knew, suppose that the initial vector 
you can write as, say, u minus v plus 5w. OK, so I've written x0 not in its standard form, but as a linear combination of the eigenvectors that we were given. So then a x0. Well, you know what a does to u? It turns it into 2u. And it turns this into minus 3v. And it turns w into w. But not only that, as we saw, any power a to the t x0 is just 2 to the t u minus, minus 3 to the t v plus 5 w. You don't need the 1. There's a 1 to the t in here as well. 1 is a very nice eigenvalue. OK, so that's the complete dynamical system. We now have a formula for it. You don't have to compute teeth powers of A. You just have to whack. You take the original coefficients, and you whack a 2 to the t there, a negative 3 to the t to the t there, and 1 to the t, which is just 1 there. So the general situation goes like this. In general, if x is equal to c1v1 plus dot 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 plus cnvn, where these are eigenvectors, x0 rather, well, I'll write it over here, where a v i equals lambda i v i. OK, so let's just stare at this for a second. For different values of i, I get different eigenvectors, and I get different eigenvalues. So I can't just put the same lambda here. I have different eigenvalues. So this is eigenvalue. And this is the eigenvector, and there's, there's different ones. So if you can do this, then x of t is the teeth power of a times x0, which equals, I just take the c1 and I insert lambda1 to the power t, v1, and so on. And then the last one is cn lambda n to the t v n. And that is very useful. That is very useful. It's the only real way to approach this as far as we're concerned. A question? You, just, you see the five on the top right of the lower board? Yeah. OK. You wanted to put a t there, but you forgot. I, no, I wanted to put in a 1 to the t. There, there is a 1 to the t in here, but you can't see it because it's just 1. But to be consistent with this formula, you need to put the teeth power of the eigenvalue in there. But the eigenvalue is just 1, you see. The eigenvalues are 2, minus 3, and 1. So 1 to the t has the nice being equal to 1. It's the only power that you never need to write apart from 0. We also said u, v, and w were independent before. OK, we did not say that u, v, and w are independent. But it turns out that different eigenvalues, if the, the eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues must be linearly independent. It's easy to see for two of them. It's easy to see that u and v must be independent. Because they can't be scalar multiples. Because, say, OK, here is an important comment that I should mention. If u is an eigenvector for eigenvalue 2, like it is here, so is any multiple of u. Right? 3u is also an eigenvalue, eigenvector. Because a of 3u will be two lots of 3u. It's all linear. So eigenvectors, okay, so this is important to note. Eigenvectors, if that's an eigenvector, so is every multiple of it except for 0. And so clearly u and v cannot be multiples of each other. They cannot have two different eigenvalues for the same eigenvector. But it's a little more sophisticated to see that more than two are not. And there is a proof in the book. All right. So I'm going to give a brief example of a, a, a dynamical system type question. And then I have to move on to 7.2.
this is a really a crash course in all the stuff that you need to know. But, you know, that will give you plenty of time for Q&A next time. Spring 06, quiz 2, question 1. Okay, A is 2 by 2, and it's given that A has eigenvectors V1 and V2 with corresponding I vowels lambda 1, which is given to be bigger than 0, and lambda 2, which equals 0. Okay, that's for this specific question. And you're given that x of t plus 1 is a x of t, and what's more, x of 0 is equal to 2v1 minus 3v2. Okay, the question is to describe the trajectory of x of t. <coughs> That's the question. Describe geometrically the trajectory of x of t. Plot the graph. Yeah, sort of plot the graph, but since we don't really know what v1 and v2 are, it's a little bit difficult. So some of these questions are much more concrete. They will say v1 equals 3,7, and you know you, yeah, you can actually plot it. But since we don't know what v1 and v2 are, we, we can sort of only plot it with respect to some mythical axes. But nevertheless, we're, we can do something, okay? So now, here is the deal. We just understand what there's going on. So in general, I'm just going to use the standard framework. x of t equals a to the power t x0, whether you write it as x subscript 0 or x0, which is equal to. What happens to v1 when you hit it many, many times with a? Well, every time you hit it with a, what happens when you hit it once with a? What is a of v1? Okay, so we should write this down just to clarify in our own minds. What do we know? What's a v1? Lambda 1 v1. And what's a v2? It's lambda 2 v2, which is 0, because we're given that that's 0. So in general, by the formula, you take the coefficient 2, you get lambda 1 to the t v1 minus 3 lambda 2 to the t v2. Okay, So again, even if you don't remember the formula, but you understand that every time you hit the v1 with a, you get an extra factor of lambda 1. And every time you hit the v2 with a, you get an extra factor of lambda 2, and everything is linear, so you can just pack them together. Now, now this is 0. So any power of it is 0. So this is actually 2 lambda 1 to the t v1. That's it. And that's true at least for t bigger than 1, bigger than or equal to 1. It's not actually true for t equals 0, because this would be 0 to the power 0, which doesn't really make sense. In any case, we know what x of 0 is. It's 2v1 minus 3v2. OK, so that's all we need to know. We just need to know that x of t is 2 lambda 1t to the power of v1. OK, so the first step. basically project x0 onto v1 but then and I don't know if it's really projection because v2 may not be orthogonal so it's not actually orthogonal so it throws away the v2 but it sends it onto let's just say sends x 0 on to, to a multiple of v1. So onto the span of v1. That's a better way of saying it. It sends it into the span of v1. How about that? So if I draw it like this, I don't know where v1 and v2 are, but if this is v1 and this is v2, my initial point was supposed to be 2v1 
minus 3v2, which would be here. So that's 2v1 minus 3v2. And so the initial one just throws away the v2 and sends us somewhere on v1. It actually doesn't matter where you start, you always throw away the v2 information because the eigenvalue is zero. Quick question. Um, don't you start at 2v1 minus 3v2? Yeah, so you start here. Right. And the next step sends you to 2v1 times lambda. So v1 was supposed to be here. There you go. V1, so this is 2v1 okay. minus 3v2. So you're actually you're coming back from that far right, right point. I'm going to the far right point, which is twice, and then I'm going in v2 direction three times the opposite direction. And that's the ex that's the starting vector. Right. Okay. So the trajectory is actually. Well, the first one, there's the first one, t equals zero. Yeah. The second one is two lambda one v one. Yeah. And I don't know what lambda one is, so it's hard for me to tell. But I know it's somewhere along this line, and it's not backwards either because lambda one is positive. So it will send me somewhere here. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then all other subsequent. But unfortunately, you need to take three <coughs> cases to see what's going on. And the correct solution, the question actually did say consider different cases of lambda 1. So there's <coughs> three different cases. Three cases. The simplest one is if lambda 1 equals 1, then x of t is 2v1 for all t greater than 1. So the vector just stays there. So it's constant trajectory after the constant after time 0, or well, after time 1 inclusive. So it basically goes bang, 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 bang. So the first step, it thinks it's 3 and then it gets track. Question. So that statement is the right step. First step sends x0 into span v1. Well, the first step, as in the, the, the first step that you make. As in you start oh, here so at 0. Yeah, when t equals 1, it sends you somewhere there. First step, i.e., t equals 1. First step away from where you started, in other words. OK, now if lambda 1 is greater than 1, then x of t is 2 lambda 1 to the t v1. So this goes off to infinity. Whatever that means. Along the direction of v1. And it's actually exponential. So wherever the initial point is, you then you get here, here, and then you go there, 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 etc. So it's like shoots off to infinity along that direction exponentially quickly. 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. Whereas if, so case 3, if lambda 1 is less than 1 but still is greater than 0, given in the question, then x of t is 2 lambda 1 to the t v goes to 0 vector along V. <coughs> so the trajectory is wherever the starting one is, and then you land here, and you go there, 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 down to zero. OK, so it's a sort of bizarre case when one of the eigenvalues is zero. It's a lot easier than when they're not. All right, I really have to move on. Cannot spend any more time in this dynamical system stuff. And I need to get more into the algebra of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So here goes. And if I have to go, say, five minutes over, I will, I'm afraid. Now, 7.2. It's a shame to go quickly here because it's important, but there's not that much stuff. OK, so please bear with me here. If AV equals lambda V, then AV 
minus lambda v is zero. Bless you. So A minus lambda times the identity matrix outside of V is the zero vector. In other words, V is in the kernel of the matrix A minus lambda I. So that is the same. This is the same as saying as V is eigenvec of A with eigenval lambda. Now, what is A minus lambda I? That is a matrix where you just take A and you subtract the same number lambda from every diagonal element. Okay, so basically then, to find to find the eigenvalues of a matrix. Well, before I say that, if this is true, then a minus lambda i is not invertible. If a matrix has a kernel and it's square, it's it's not a, it's not invertible. Only a kernel of zero would be invertible. A non empty kernel in non empty vector in the kernel is a eigenvector. Oh no, it is. If there is any non zero vector in this kernel, then this is true, this is true, this is true. So the kernel is all the eigenvectors eigen vectors for eigenvalue lambda. Absolutely. If it's so do you want any eigenvectors at all, then this matrix had better be not invertible. It has to have a real kernel, not just the zero. And therefore, it's not invertible. Therefore, its determinant has to be non-zero. And everything works in reverse. If the determinant, I'm sorry, the determinant has to be zero. If it is zero, it's not invertible. So the kernel is not just zero. And therefore, there are eigenvalue, eigenvectors for that particular lambda. So to find the evals of a matrix, solve the equation Debt a minus lambda i equals zero for lambda. There will not be very many lambdas. There will only be a few special ones. So let's look at an example. E.g. Uh, let a be equal to three minus two five <coughs> one zero seven. 0, 0, 2. Okay, so, so the determinant of A minus lambda I is the determinant of this matrix. 3 minus lambda, minus 2, 5, 1, minus lambda, 7, 0, 0, 2 minus lambda. OK, so I just took the original matrix, and I put a minus lambda just on the diagonal entries. So I just have to find this determinant. So I'm going to actually expand it along this row, which is the third row. So everything is still plus, minus, plus. So this is equal to 2 minus lambda outside of 3 minus lambda times minus lambda. Minus minus two, plus two, which is two minus lambda, three uh, lambda squared minus three lambda plus two. And if I want to sort of solve that equals zero, I have to go like this: two minus lambda, and I factor this into lambda minus two lambda plus 1, uh, lambda minus 1. All right, so <laughs> debt A minus lambda I is equal to minus lambda minus 2 all squared lambda minus 1. I've just, I, I made the 2 minus lambda into minus lambda minus 2, and then I combined that in that. And so this equals 0 only 
when lambda equals 1 or lambda equals 2. And these are the eigenvalues of A. These are the eigenvalues of A. It does not tell you what the eigenvectors are, and that's the topic of 7.3, actually. Um, when you trade Y, when you subtract... Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. All right, so there's a practical example of finding the eigenvalues of A. Take the matrix, put the minuses, get the determinant, Try to factor it so that you can solve for lambda equals zero. Sometimes the quadratic here might have, might not be factorable, so that that wouldn't give you any eigenvalues. In this case, we do only get two eigenvalues, even though we have a three by three matrix. By the way, it's quite clear that you cannot have more than three eigenvalues. Why? Well, let's take a look at this. Lambda, lambda, lambda. The most we could get is a lambda cubed. So whatever polynomial you get out of here, the degree of it cannot be more than 3. It could be less than 3, but it, it cannot be more than 3. Here it's equal to 3. And no polynomial of degree 3 or less can have more than 3 solutions. So already we know that an n by n matrix cannot have more than n eigenvalues, but it could have fewer. All right. So that's already very important. Let's look at a 2 by 2 case very quickly, and then we'll try to write down a general rule. The 2 by 2 case, you have A equals A, B, C, D, and then you have this debt of A minus lambda I. It's the term of A minus lambda, B, C, D minus lambda, which is equal to A minus lambda b minus lambda minus bc. Now I'm going to arrange this as follows. It's lambda squared minus, and we'll have, I'm sorry, there's a d here, d minus lambda. So it's lambda squared minus a plus d lots of lambda plus ad minus bc. <coughs> okay, so these coefficients are actually <laughs> quite special. This one is just the determinant of A itself, AD minus BC. <coughs> that was the original determinant. This is, ignoring the minus, this is the trace of A. So TR of A in general, of A for A square, it has to be a square, n by n is the sum of the diagonal elements of A. It's sort of like the determinant in that It's linear in the matrices. It doesn't respect multiplication or addition. Well, it doesn't respect multiplication like the determinant does. But in any case, for a 2 by 2 matrix, the determinant, the trace rather, is A plus D. And that is exactly the coefficient that popped up here. OK, so now we are going to define the following. <coughs> the characteristic equation let's say the characteristic polynomial of A is the determinant of a minus lambda i, and this is now n-dimensional, and you call this, well, let's write this, is f sub lambda, no, f sub a of lambda, that's better. Okay, I, I'll write this more. Of a is f sub a of lambda. And the characteristic equation is f equals 0, i.e. the determinant equals 0. The solutions 
are the eigenvalues of A. That's a summary of what we've been saying. Okay, now, structure of this characteristic polynomial. First of all, it's of degree n. So, so actually, I said it could be less than n. In fact, it can't. Please ignore that. If you see, there will always be a term n. So I don't know what I, I was on. I don't know what I was thinking. The characteristic polynomial has degree n. And the first one is always minus lambda to the n. The first, the nth degree term, the leading term. The next term is in any dimension equal to the trace of a times minus lambda to the n minus 1. And that's consistent with what we saw in the 2 by 2 case. Then you have other terms which are a little more complicated to describe, and we will not do so. And then finally, the constant term is always the determinant of A. So this is true for any size matrix, and we verified it for a 2 by 2 matrix. Now actually, it's quite easy to see why the constant term is the determinant of A. That's not a mystery. Put lambda equals 0. And you get 0, 0, 0, 0. So the debt A is just the constant term. And if you look at it, debt A minus 0, when you put lambda equals 0, you do get debt A. So debt A has to be the constant term. You just get that original determinant. Lambda's not there. But to see why it's the trace is a little more sophisticated. And if anyone wants to see an easier version than the book, I will be glad to show you in about two minutes after this class finishes. <coughs> Don't know when that will be, though. Not long. Not long. OK. So this characteristic polynomial is, as you might say, well important. Now, basically, I just have, I want to finish actually with a few facts. Three facts. Actually, no. I don't want to finish with three facts. I want to look at this polynomial for a second. I want to look at this polynomial. In our example, I just want to relate it to this. In our previous example, and then I will only give you two facts. We saw that f lambda a is minus lambda minus 2 all squared lambda minus 1. That's what it is. So let's expand this out. This is minus lambda minus lambda plus 4 times lambda minus 1. And if we expand this out, we get negative lambda cubed will have a plus lambda squared from these two and a plus that. So we'll have a 5 lambda squared. Then in terms of lambdas, we will have. 4 lambda with a minus, and then minus, minus, minus is another lambda. So I guess we get minus 8 lambda. And then finally, the constant term will be 4. Okay, so actually, if you look over here, the eigenvalues you might consider as 1 and 2. But I want to think of the eigenvalues as 1, 2, and 2. Why 2 and 2? Because this is a square here. I actually have two factors of lambda. So think of them as 2 and 2. And more on that in a second. OK, so I want you to notice something that 1 plus 2 plus 2 is 5. And 1 times 2 times 2 is 4. And this is not a coincidence. So now I'm going to try to tie all these together in just a few facts. So here are two facts. Fact one. Okay. The algebraic multiplicity of lambda is equal to, well, of lambda zero for A, is the highest power <coughs> of lambda minus lambda zero dividing evenly into the characteristic polynomial. So in other words, 
the easiest thing to do is see in our example. In our example, 1 has multiplicity 1 because lambda minus 1 to the power of 1 is the factor. And rather confusingly, 2 has multiplicity 2. But that's just a coincidence that those numbers worked. The main point is that lambda minus 2 has a squared power. So of course, if this was lambda minus 5 to the square power, then 5 would have multiplicity 2. So I'm sorry that it's a confusing example. It did not occur to me that this, these numbers would <laughs> happen to match, but they don't have to match. Okay, so basically you factor the characteristic polynomial and you see what the power of lambda minus whatever it is, lambda minus the eigenvalue is. And that's the algebraic <coughs> multiplicity. So you do need to be aware of this. There's also a geometric multiplicity, but that doesn't come into it until the next section, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I do have to tell you the second fact. Fact two, and this is a really nice one. And again, I cannot show it to you, but I, I mean, I cannot explain why until after the class if anyone wants to see. But here it is. Okay, the trace of the matrix A is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues if a matrix has. Okay, let me just. I've got to write this out first. If A has n eigenvalues. lambda 1 through lambda n counting algebraic multiplicity. Counting algebraic mults. So in our example up here, if you just uh, pan over here for a second, up the top there, 1, 2, 2. I'm going to count the 2 twice because there were two factors of it. So I'm going to consider the three eigenvalues to be 1, 2, and 2. I'm counting the 2 twice because of algebraic multiplicity. So if you have n of them, then the trace of A is equal to n lambda 1 up to lambda n. So this is the sum of the diagonal elements. And this is the sum of the eigenvalues. They happen to be the same. OK, now consider this. The determinant of A is the product of the eigenvalues. That's beautiful. That is really, really nice. So I just want to come back over here. I've erased the matrix now, but the determinant turned out to be, well, look, the matrix was this. 3, minus 2, 5, 1, 0, 7, 0, 0, 2. It's easy to compute that the determinant is 4, which happens to be the product of the three eigenvalues, 1 times 2 times 2. And the trace is 5, 3, 0, which is the sum, 1 plus 2 plus 2, and also appears here. So that sort of example, I've now connected all of these facts into one fact. All right, and then. The only, only other fact that I should just mention, <coughs> if A is triangular, then the eigenvalues are the diagonal elements. And that is because A is triangular, upper or lower, A might be equal to A11, A22, all the way up to ANN, with stuff here, but zeros here. So the determinant of A minus lambda I is the determinant of still an upper triangular <coughs> matrix, A11 minus lambda a22 minus lambda, all the way up to ann minus lambda, stuff, zero. But it's just the product, a11 minus lambda, a22 minus lambda, and so on, ann minus lambda. So it has n eigenvalues, 
including multiplicities, and they are the diagonal elements, no matter what they are, even if they're repeated, and all this still applies. Okay? Rotations do not have n eigenvalues. A 2 by 2 rotation has no eigenvalues. This does not apply. Okay, this applies here because it's 3 by 3 and there are three eigenvalues when you include multiplicity. <coughs> all right, I am sorry I went over time. That's all I have to say. Next week, same place, come early. Spiros, good luck on the quiz. <laughs>